The Teal Mask DLC has come out and rocked the already chaotic world of the post-Pokemon Home Scarlet and Violet metagame. In this video, we'll be exploring the most impactful changes made to existing Pokemon, seeing which ones were buffed the most, or the winners, and which ones were nerfed the most, or the losers. We've got a top three of both categories, and in addition, we'll be covering a few extras that weren't quite significant enough to make the final cut, yet we still found them worth mentioning. The honorable and dishonorable mentions. It's important to mention that in this video specifically, we are not covering brand new Pokemon like Augur Pond, as they did not have any previous existence to measure their status against. That'll be for another video. However, new forms of existing Pokemon are fair game. Now, without further ado, let's jump right into the winners and losers of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet's Teal Mask DLC. We're starting off with a pair of Generation 4 ground types, neither of which were seen in Gen 8, but now have immediately made an impact upon their return in Gen 9. On one hand, we have Gliscor, which has never been anything less than an OU staple and has even ventured into Ubers on occasion. On the other, we have Torterra, which has never had any OU viability whatsoever. The closest it got was a couple of diehard Gen 4 fans theorycrafting sets that didn't actually work. Yes, Rock Paul Torterra might be threatening, but it lacked the power boost it needed to break through bulkier Pokemon. What about using Rock Polish and Swords Dance then? Well, in that case, you would lack Stone Edge's coverage and become completely ruined by the plethora of flying types that would stuff both its stabs, as well as really lacking any tools to hit opposing grass types. What it really needed was a move that was both Swords Dance and Rock Polish at the same time. And no, Dragon Dance wouldn't be a sufficient compromise, as it'd still be too slow even after a boost. Well, come Generation 9, Torterra has received a move that many felt was long overdue for it, given the giant shell on its back, Shell Smash, which packs the boosts of both Swords Dance and Rock Polish simultaneously. And this move has rocketed it to legitimate OE status for the first time ever. Sure, it comes with the side effects of dropping Torterra's defenses. It's a worthwhile price to pay for immediately, as with it, Torterra becomes so fast and so strong, it becomes capable of smashing through a great portion of the meta game, including most of the popular Pokemon around. Torterra is on the niche side, as it offers next to no defensive utility and only really gets one shot at its sweep, which can still be disrupted since Torterra's low speed leaves it outsped by Choice Scarfers even after a boost. It doesn't seem like there's much likelihood of it staying OU once the novelty wears off. However, it's almost surely going to ruin a lower tier or two once it drops, and the fact that it has legitimately been seen blasting through OU teams is enough for us to let it share the spotlight as the number three winner. It's nice to see the most neglected Gen 4 starter finally get something great, enough to rocket it up to the hollowed annals of standard play, however briefly, alongside Infernape and Empoleon. Gen 9 marks for the first time Gliscor has appeared in a generation without Hidden Power. It was theorized that without Hidden Power Ice Around, it would be banned immediately were it ever dropped into Gen 8, a sentiment that hasn't entirely dissipated with its introduction into Gen 9. This alone would already power it into contention as a winner. What holds it back from is Gen 9's immense power creep, helped greatly by terrestrialization, as well as the devastating fact that Gliscor no longer has access to Roost, meaning it no longer enjoys the full extent of the absurd pseudo-immortality that was its trademark in Generations 5-7. through 7. Of course, it still sticks around incredibly well when relying on Protect to extract as much recovery as possible from its Poison Heal, as demonstrated in Gen 5. In Black and White, one, it couldn't use Roost alongside Poison Heal and still had amazing longevity, as well as often preferring to use Protect as its healing even when Roost became available to it in Black and White 2. But losing Roost meant it's no longer able to pull off some of its trademark heroics that were so commonplace to its specially defensive Swords Dance variants in Generations 6 and 7, where it would Roost stall entire teams as it boosted repeatedly in ways that could not be replicated with Protect. With this in mind, could the removal of Hidden Power alone really be enough to just justify its place as a number 3 winner of the Teal Mask DLC? Almost surely not, but Gliscor received far more than the absence of a 
tactic previously used to slow it down. It received both spikes and toxic spikes, and has immediately used these in conjunction with its monstrous defensive presence against an enormous slew of threats, running around to become one of the best hazard setters in the tier, as well as the best Pokemon full stop. Oh, you want to use heavy duty boots to bypass these hazards? Well, Gliscor also has knockoff, and will make quick work of that. It's also an excellent hazard setter because everyone's favorite hazard remover, Great Tusk, doesn't want to come into Gliscor at all for fear of Toxic. Meanwhile, Gliscor is as resilient as ever, with its astonishingly good typing in conjunction with immunity to status and opposing spikes. Gliscor is an elite OU Pokemon once again, but in a form it's never taken on before, thanks to Game Freak's generous treatment of ground types in Gen 9, and thus it comes in as the number 3 winner on this list. Okay, if referring to Great Tusk as a loser feels quite harsh, as it's still an incredible Pokemon that stands firmly among the elite picks in OU, which is why it is the lowest so-called loser on this list. But the fact is, it did experience a significant drop-off from its previous spot in the metagame, where it could just about do nothing wrong. Great Tusk's newfound problems are multifaceted. First of all, as mentioned previously, it does not care for Gliscor's presence, as it fears Toxic and is not able to switch into it to threaten Rapid Spin meaning it's easier to wear down passively unless it chooses to run heavy duty boots as its item. Gliscor's negative impact on Great Tusk goes beyond that though. If Great Tusk doesn't want Gliscor switching into it and you do not want Gliscor coming in for free any more than is absolutely necessary, then it is forced to run Ice Spinner, which is by no means a bad choice, but severely restricts its moveset in a way that it previously did not have to contend with. Gliscor isn't Great Tusk's only issue either. The other big one is that much of the new metagame centers around threats that blow Great Tusk apart with little effort. Now sure, there have always been threats like Iron Valiant, which continued its excellence, but this was a lot more overwhelming when paired with other such threats of its ilk, which there are so many of. Ogre Pond forms, Manaphy, a buffed Walking Wake, and the immense popularity of Rain. Thus, its defensive presence is no longer as impressive, especially because it's now competing with the most elite OU grounds of all time in both Gliscor and Landorus Therian. But make no mistake, Great Tusk is still as high tier OU as it gets. It's just no longer going basically unchallenged as it ruled over anything and everything like it did previously. The second loser on this list is a Pokemon that's been an OU stable for the past generation and a half, Slowking. And it's particularly interesting because it actually just received Scald. What could go wrong for it, especially now that it's been re-gifted such an amazing move that was a staple of its moveset in Gen 8? It's one of the most famously resilient Pokemon around, with both reliable healing and slack off, and the amazing passive healing of Regenerator, while being able to facilitate free switch-ins for its teammates. Whereas it previously teleported, now it's got chilly reception, even adding the setup of snow to its repertoire. And yet, now that it can once again threaten opponents with burn, it's worse than it was before? Yes, strange though it may seem. And you can chalk this up to the utterly insane power creep just added to a generation that was already bursting at the seams with it. Walking Wake, a Pokemon Slowking had previously done quite well against, is now able to harass and take advantage of it freely with knockoff and flip turn. Speaking of increased flip turn distribution, this has also turned one of Slow King's previous best matchups, Rain, on its head, as it, Floatzel, and Baskew Legion smack it hard and gain switch advantage against it with the move. Slow King and Great Tusk are similar in this regard. Furthermore, the most powerful metagame-defining threats just blow it away. Each Ogre Pond form, Blood Moon Ursa Luna, and of course the tear-shredding Manaphy. You know what players use instead of Slow King? Galarian Slow King, as it matches up much better against the metagame at large. Slow King is far from a bad Pokemon on its own right of course, but the metagame as it stands right now is inhospitably hostile to it.
Previously, Ursaluna was a superb physical attacker, thanks to its huge attack boosted further by Guts and complementary stab combination with high base power moves to say nothing of the absurd overkill of Swords Dance. It was truly unwallable. As a bonus, it also had amazing physical bulk and wasn't a complete pushover on the special side either, thanks to its utterly gargantuan HP stat. Ursaluna was still on the niche side though, finding itself in Yuyu, because while it could threaten the daylights out of anything in OU, its low speed in conjunction with its weakness laden typing meant it wasn't difficult to revenge kill, an issue compounded by it cutting into its own longevity with Flame Warp. Now, however, Ursaluna has received a new form, Blood Moon Ursaluna, usually just referred to as Blood Moon, and in keeping with its terrifying design, it's utterly horrifying to face. Why? Okay, it's got less HP than base Ursaluna, but its defense stat is so much higher that it's actually slightly physically bulkier. Alright, so between its lower HP and lower special defense, it's not taking special hits nearly as well. Ah, or so you think. But that's the trick. Blood Moon easily fixes this issue with Calm Mind. Wait, Calm Mind? Isn't Ursaluna a physical attacker? It certainly is. But whereas Ursaluna packs an incredible attack stat, Blood Moon packs an incredible special attack stat. Alright, sure you're thinking, but what's the big deal? Its special attack is actually slightly lower than Ursaluna's attack, and it's boosting less with Calm Mind than it would with Swords Dance, and it doesn't have a power boosting ability, so what gives? Several things. First of all, Blood Moon is Ursaluna's polar opposite in terms of longevity. Whereas Ursaluna wears itself down from the flame orb it uses to power itself up, and the headlong rush that's one of its strongest offensive weapons, Blood Moon uses Calm Mind alongside max HP and defense, meaning after a single boost, especially since it uses leftovers as its item. Okay, but being unkillable after a boost in and of itself doesn't automatically make something threatening. So what about Ursaluna's power? Well, putting aside for a second the fact that Ursaluna's incredible bulk makes Makes it ridiculously easy for it to accrue multiple boosts, it has absolutely no issues with power. Its main stab attack is the signature move its form is named for, Blood Moon, a normal move which clocks in at an absolutely stupefying 140 base power, plowing through even resists after a boost. No chance to dodge it either, as it's got 100% accuracy. Okay, any drawbacks? Well, it can't be used twice in a row, so Blood Moon's got to wait one turn, which is the easiest thing in the world for it to bypass. Many Blood Moon tack on Protect and bam, problem solved. Become invulnerable for a turn, then blast something else. It's so bulky after Calm Mind, it doesn't exactly fear getting attacked either, and thus doesn't need to run Protect. A common alternative is Moonlight, whose recovery makes it even more impossible to muscle through. Oh, and it also has great priority to compensate for its low speed in the form of Vacuum Wave, and sometimes even to rastalize into a fighting type to gain stab on it, as well as change up its weaknesses, making it even even more absurd to deal with. Oh, and just to really rub it in, Blood Moon's ability Mind's Eye means it can hit ghost types with Blood Moon as well as Vacuum Wave. Sometimes it'll terrestrialize into a fairy type too, just to have one of the best defensive typings in the game, turning its fighting weakness into a fighting resist, and sometimes it'll even tear it into a poison type to maintain that fight resist while also becoming immune to toxic, removing any shot of stalling it out that way. And it doesn't even have to worry about becoming weak to Gliscor's Earthquake since since it's so bulky it takes a paltry 30% anyway. Blood Moon Ursa Luna is absolutely absurd and frankly, nobody should be surprised to see it banned from OU in the near future. Before we get to the number one winner and loser, we quickly have some honorable and dishonorable mentions for both categories. Empoleon leads off the honorable mentions category, receiving several amazing new tools. The momentum of flip turn, the defog punishing special attack boost of competitive, and at long last, the reliable recovery of Roos. It's particularly excellent in its ability to completely stifle Walking Wake. Alomomola and Walking Wake itself also are notable flip turn recipients, while Alomomola additionally receives Scald and Wake got knockoff. Speaking of knockoff, several notable dark types received the move. Roaring Moon, Hydreigon, and yes, Tyranitar. Maybe this is the tool Pokemon's Godzilla needs to start working its way back up to the tearing rung in this post-pursuit world. Finally, in the spirit of Torterra being OU, however temporarily that might wind up being, we must also mention Furret. Yes, Furret, a Pokemon famously highlighted as one of the worst competitive choices in our video on it, which is a crying shame given how adorable it is. 
but now it is actually OU. Now don't get too excited, it didn't get any buffs. Well, it got tidy up, which is an amazing move, but not nearly enough to compensate for being, you know, furred. It's just a matter of it being a newly released Pokemon, and by some miracle of the Poke Gods, enough players using it to actually see it become OU. And then when others see Furret as a genuine OU Pokemon, they get excited and use Furret themselves. It surely won't last, but seeing Furret actually in the standard metagame is a delightfully goofy change of pace. As for the dishonorable mentions, Knockoff has regained widespread distribution, and yet despite being given to its fellow Unova genies in Thunderous and Tornadus, Landorus has been deprived of the move for some reason. So too has Toxapex, which has also been deprived of the newly returned Scald and the flip turn that was given to so many other waters. These aren't drastic enough to warrant truly being on the losers list, but they do bear mentioning. The biggest loser is, of course, another former OU Titan. Clefable is still a decent Pokemon in the tier, but it is nowhere near its previous metagame ruling status. Surely it can't be a matter of power creep alone, right? Clefable's made a career out of underwhelming seeming stats beating high-powered pokes. You'd be right, it's not that at all. It's the fact that it had a bunch of crucial utility moves hacked away from its move pool. No more aromatherapy or heal bell. Okay, that's a blow, but hardly the most essential thing. So it's manageable. No more teleport. That's more brutal to be sure, but still fine. No more soft boiled. Nope, that's too much. Wait, you say. Recovery moves got nerfed to 8 PP this generation, and Clefable still has Moonlight. What's the problem? Well, Moonlight has its recovery percentage slashed in rain or snow, and those two weathers just happen to be everywhere, especially snow thanks to the newly added Alolan Ninetales, which has incredibly high usage, as well as Chili Reception Galarian Snow King. Wait, Clefable can also heal with Wish, which can also heal its teammates. Yes, that's true, but when Clefable is forced to rely on a two-turn, two-move slot recovery for itself, it becomes a lot more exploitable. Clef is much, much less able to take on opponents now, which hurts its ability to support its team. It still gets the job done quite well, but it's nowhere near the overwhelming force it was prior and for that reason it is the number one loser on this list Backscalibur was already an arguably broken beast previously, thanks to the strength of its snow-based set with Substitute, Dragon Dance, Icicle Crash, and Earthquake. It would take advantage of the snow providing it a valuable defense boost while also activating its Ice Body ability, meaning it healed huge amounts of health per turn alongside leftovers. And of course, it was incredibly easy to both set up snow and get it on the field thanks to Chili Reception Slow King, both Johto and Galar. However, the new addition of Alolan 9 Tails has really taken this set to utterly ludicrous extremes, as in addition to Snow, it also provides Aurora Veil, meaning Backscalibur becomes absolutely unkillable on the physical side while having its special defense boosted as well. It was basically akin to fighting Zygarde complete with Poison Heal, except Backscalibur packed immediate destructive power far beyond Zygarde C's reach. Number one and number two, it was actually slightly physically bulkier than Zygarde C, at least with Snow and Aurora Veil active. Its bulk was so utterly absurd, if you wanted to, you could invest in enough bulk to have its substitute survive bulky Great Tusk's close combat. Yes, that mighty attack would deal a whopping 24.9% max. This wasn't actually necessary since you were going to dominate Great Tusk anyway, but it serves as an incredible example of how monstrously bulky Backscalibur was in these conditions. Of course, the addition of Alolan Ninetales wasn't the only major boost for Backscalibur. It also received Scale Shot, which was absolutely absurd. Previously, Backscalibur boosted its speed with Dragon Dance, but now it boosted its speed with an unbelievably powerful stab move. Thanks to its loaded dice item, which it already enjoyed to similarly abuse maximum power Icicle Spear, Scale Shot would always hit five times, which at 25 base power per hit meant it clocked in at an absolutely stunning 125 base power with five hits, making it even stronger than the Dragon Stab Backscalibur had previously dropped opponents with. Glaive Rush. With the speed 
speed-boosting, mega-powerful scale shot taking Glaive Rush's place, Backscalibur no longer had the need to run Dragon Dance and could instead run Swords Dance to make itself even more absurdly strong. Backscalibur would brute force through its unmatched capabilities of outspeeding and obliterating everything. And as if that wasn't enough, the fact that opponents had to contend with Sub DD and Scale Shot SD made it even scarier. Scale Shot SD was the more popular one thanks to Scale Shot's self sufficiency in both attacking with incredible power and boosting speed, making it easier for Backscalibur to instantly threaten opponents. But the overwhelming presence of its set forcing opponents to take into consideration actually helped make Sub DD even scarier, as that variant was hard enough to deal with as it was without the part where you didn't even know it might be that set. Set. Some players referred to Backscalibur as effectively a shadow tag Pokemon because of how it forced KOs whenever it hit the field. If you switched and allowed it just one turn of setup, you probably lost. That's how obscene it was. You had to keep your Pokemon on the field just to prevent that free setup, and thus Backscalibur would just collect a free kill. Oh, and then there was the fact that there was Snow and Aurora Veil support it would set up against you no matter what. It was hilarious in how ridiculously it smashed everything. Why are we talking about Backscalibur in the past tense given how recent this whole thing is well backscalibur was so ridiculous it had already been banned from ou surprising absolutely nobody and earning it without a shadow of a doubt its spot as the number one winner of the teal mask dlc and that's it. Obviously, with as many additions and changes as the Teal Mask DLC brought to the table, there are plenty more Pokemon that could have been mentioned here. Plus, the order of these things can be quite subjective, though in our opinion, it's pretty impossible to argue against Backscalibur. Either way, let us know in the comments, do you think there were any Pokemon that could have been mentioned, or should the order of these Pokemon have been different, and why? We look forward to reading them, and we'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching, everyone, and as always, if you like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content and thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos and thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms and that's all I got. See you next time everyone.